The 21st Century Model Concord Vineyard, Part 1, The Influence of Training System and SO4 Rootstock on Vine Performance. This is a project being conducted at the Southwest Michigan Research and Extension Center near Benton Harbor, Michigan, and we acknowledge the support from the National Grape Cooperative, from Project Green of MSU's Ag Bio Research, and from MSUE Extension. The purposes of this project are to see if we can change the architecture of a Concord grape vineyard so that it becomes more productive, that is, can yield more tons per acre, and also to see if we can take this new architecture and mechanize it to reduce the costs of labor that are required to grow a Concord grape. Please keep in mind that this presentation is a progress report on this project and that the data that we present is just that. It is not a suggestion of the sustained yields that are attainable with this project or that the fruit quality that we attained this year is the necessary targeted goal. We allowed vines to fully crop in this first full crop year of this vineyard and we will be seeking to find the long-term sustainable productivity of these vines in the years to come. This is a schematic drawing of a current standard Concord grape vineyard. We have a top wire cordon training system sometimes called Hudson River Umbrella, with a trunk up to the top of a six-foot tall trellis, a cordon established along the top wire, and then varying lengths of canes or spurs along the top of that cordon. The standard dimension of vine spacing, we're saying, is about eight feet, and that does vary from one grower to another. Looking at this schematic in another way, it would look somewhat like this looking at it from the end of the row with a fruit bearing zone at the top of the vine and then the canopy of leaves falling down the length of the trellis. A typical Concord vineyard in Michigan at least has a row spacing of about nine feet. And this is what that looks like in practice. Here at the Southwest Michigan Research and Extension Center, which we will henceforth call Swimrec, we have this top wire cordon, Concord train, row of vines, six feet tall, and in this case, multiple trunks rather than a single trunk. The concept for changing the training system or the structure of a Concord vine for this project is to see if we can add a second fruiting zone on the trellis as pictured here. And we're calling this a two-tier cordon training system. And it really is patterned off of a training system developed in New Zealand with a very, very fun name called the Tikiwata Two-Tier. So we have this cordon at the top, and then three feet down from the top, we have a second cordon. And to make this work, we needed enough uh, trellis area to have enough leaf area to support the extra crop load. So we have extended the height of the trellis up to seven feet, and the reason we only go to seven feet is because we think that most grower equipment in the field today could accommodate a seven foot tall trellis. So here's the schematic that looks from the end like this and it is showing two fruiting zones and 
for this project to try to increase productivity per acre we are narrowing the row spacing down from 9 feet to 8 feet. And here it is applied at the Swimrick facility way back in 2005. We had this in place and we've been working with this for over a decade now. You can see the post extensions and the start of growth back in 2005 of a two-tier cordon trained Concord vineyard. One might ask, why is that different than this forearm Niffin training system that was devised around 1852 by Mr. William Niffin in the Hudson River Valley of New York? There's two fruiting zones here along a, a top wire and then down in this case 22 inches. So why is this any different? And my answer to that would be that one, we're doing cordons instead of canes, but more importantly, we're changing our whole outlook on how we manage the canopy or the leaves of the vines that we are, that we are using. In this case, back in the 1800s, vines were trained during pruning to a wire or wires like this, but there was no manipulation of the shoots of the leaves on the vine and this system worked back at that time because the vines were so small they weren't fertilized the weed control was modest uh, and there would be small vines that would be open producing modest crops back in the mid 1800s as technology advanced and we were able to exert better weed control and to fertilize vines the vine size grew and when that happened those lower canes on the wire down 22 inches became more and more shaded they became less and less fruitful and they ultimately contributed little to the overall productivity of the vine and that's why we over time evolved to the top wire cordon training system so if we're going to have two fruiting zones on the vine, we're going to have to do something different than was done back in the 1800s. We're going to have to exert canopy management. Let's take a look at these four variations. Here's top wire cordon, the standard six foot top wire cordon in June of 2015. And that's what vines look like and this is the start of the first fruiting, full fruiting year of vines in this project. This is the same top wire cordon, but these vines are on an SO4 rootstock to make them much more vigorous and larger. You can see before I switch to the next slide, uh, there are lots and lots of clusters developing on this young vine on top wire cordon and with an SO4 rootstock. From there we transition to the two-tier cordon. These are on own rooted vines, no rootstock here, and this is what they look like on June 2nd of 2015 with the start of growth. And then lastly we have the two-tier cordon but on an SO4 rootstock and to me those vines look more vigorous, larger, somewhat larger than those on their own roots. Before we show you the next slide I'm going to say that we're concerned that if we try to crop these vines more they're going to become devigorated, the vine size will become small and that's why we're considering a rootstock rather than just own rooted vines. So here just 19 days later is this vineyard and it's beginning to look more like a jungle than a vineyard with all of the growth taking place in the third week of June. If we were to just 
let the vineyard grow like this without any manipulation of the canopy, we would ultimately have a disaster. So from here, we need to decide how are we going to keep the shoots on these vines under control and managed well rather than just let them grow randomly like this. And it's for that reason that vineyard mechanization is a major component of this project. Without it, we couldn't begin to have the type of vine architecture that we're seeking. Here's a picture from 2013. We spent several years developing this mechanical shoe positioner. You can see it at work just uh, a week or two after bloom in 2013 and the idea here is to get a more structured organized uh, vine with the canopy down the sides of the trellis with the clusters at the top well exposed to sunlight and that area along the cordon at the top well exposed to sunlight so that it can develop fruitful buds for producing next year's crop. And here we are in 2015 with this unit and you can see on the 21st of June what a jungle we have and we're going to see this unit working. We lose a few leaves in this process but we've made this unit so gentle that we virtually lose no crop with this manipulation. We have two five foot long barrels that go along both sides of the trellis at the same time to position these shoots. There we are. So as a result of that operation, and we just do this one time, about two weeks after bloom, you can see how the shoots are now pendulant, how the clusters at the top and on the second row of cropping on the lower cordon are also being positioned because those barrels are long enough to reach down to the second cordon. Right after we perform this operation, the vineyard does not look happy at all. But within a couple of days, the shoots have reoriented so that we have the normal orientation of shoots and leaves. But I have to admit, the day of this task, things look unhappy on the vines. But it's a very temporary situation. We're also working to mechanize the pruning component of this project. This is a French built blunt pruner, and we have a ways to go yet. Admittedly, this is an ongoing part of the project, but we have a good start on it, we think. Uh, but there are other aspects of this mechanical pruner yet to be developed to make it fully functional. We need to do this on a trailer, we feel, because there's too much weight for the positioner and for the pruner to hang it off the right front end of a tractor. So that's where we're at on the mechanization of pruning in this project at this time. So here we are, July 20th. This is now a month after the shoe positioning that took place on June 21st. And we have on the left the standard six foot top wire cordon and on the right the seven foot two tier cordon. And you can see quite a difference in the architecture of the vineyard. You can see that there's still uh, the appearance of a well position. The shoots are hanging down. If you look carefully on the vines in the foreground, you can see clusters well exposed to sunlight a month after this positioning. And here's some video of that, the top wire cordon. You can see, occasionally you'll see a 
broken chute and brown leaves but by and large this unit of uh, positioning is rather gentle on the vines and on that same day the two-tier cordon that's the upper cordon at the top of course and then we dip down and we take a look at that second cordon near the bottom uh, three feet below the top wire and you can see that the clusters are exposed perhaps not as well as at the top but reasonably well exposed to sunlight a month after positioning. Well, let's skip ahead. This is file footage from 2014, just showing you that uh, one of the National Grape Co-op members, Mr. John Hinkleman, uh, is gracious enough to help us with the mechanical harvest of this vineyard and his two BEI machines um, do get over that seven foot tall trellis. In 2014, we were able to pick all the crop, but we have to admit that in 2015, um, that harvesting unit was unable to fully pick the Concord grapes on that lower cordon. So, um, we're having to go back to the drawing boards, if you will, to uh, decide what we need to do to get uh, the beaters adjusted on the harvester or perhaps a different harvester to make the system fully functional on this seven foot tall trellis. Here is the uh, payout sheet. I'm not sure what it's called, but something like that. We are. Uh, members of the National Grape Co-op and we had four loads and I uh, put this in because these were harvested on the 18th of October and the weighted average of all of the uh, loads that went in for this project averaged 15.9 bricks. So because the numbers we're going to show you now for our plot work are not going to be the same soluble solids, but they were harvested about a week earlier than the commercial harvest. So let's start in. Hoping you remember, we have two training systems, top wire cordon, two tier cordon, and those have either uh, a rootstock or none, their own rooted vines. So there's four treatments. And we'll start with the first one and the top wire cordon without a rootstock, the most standard commercial current approach to growing Concord grapes resulted uh, overall with a pruning weight of four and a half pounds per vine, which is quite a large vine. And these were pruning weights that were taken before the start of the 2015 growing season. We had a yield of about 12.8 tons and the bricks were 14.7 on the date of harvest here uh, of our plots on the 13th of October. Moving down where we add the SO4 rootstock to the top wire cordon training system we have 15.2 tons, significantly more, two to three tons more. And I would say that the pruning weights for all of these remained uh, about the same across treatments, so we won't talk about those anymore for the moment. And then the bricks was 14.9, which statistically is no different than the 14.7 of the treatment one. Now we get into the two-tier cordon, and we had a yield that was comparable to treatment two, in this case 15.8 tons, and the soluble solids we measured were 15.0, once again statistically not significantly different than the other treatments. The two-tier cordon with the SO4 rootstock had a whopping 20.2 tons to the acre and the soluble solids were at 14.6 with 
which again is not statistically significant, but certainly would be significantly different for a grower trying to uh, deliver these uh, to market. But in terms of our numbers that we gather and analyze statistically, those four bricks uh, were identical. But you can see a huge range in yields from 12.8 tons all the way to 20.2 tons for those two treatments. And as you'd expect, the two-tier cordon with two cordons, if you're looking at those columns for clusters per vine, there's far more clusters per vine uh, in the two-tier cordon training systems. And the cluster weight is about the same for all the treatments. Well, now we're going to give you a kind of a picture of what this five-acre vineyard looks like from a golf cart some distance away with a telephoto lens. And I put this in here just to give you some orientation that this vineyard is on a north to south facing slope. So we're looking at this vineyard from the north. And so it slopes downhill essentially from the south to the north. These look like short rows because of the telephoto lens, but they're actually 400 foot long rows. And I say this because we're going to show you some differences now that relate from the top of the vineyard on the south end in the background to the north end of the vineyard, which is in the foreground. Um, and we're just going to do some analysis of our yields and fruit quality based on whether we were at the top of the slope or at the bottom of the vineyard on this slope. Okay, let's start out and discuss the top of the vineyard and the bottom of the vineyard in regard to soil tests that we took there. And we acknowledge that the National Grape Cooperative provided for us soil test kits and petiole test kits that made this sampling and analysis possible. So starting with the soil tests, at the top of the vineyard we had a soil pH of 5.7 and at the bottom 6.9. Quite a large difference in soil pH over a distance of 400 feet. And so we begin to put together a picture of how dramatically different these vines are 400 feet apart from the top to the bottom of this vineyard. If we look at the soil tests in terms of organic matter, oh my gosh, 1.85% organic matter at the top of the vineyard and 3.35% at the bottom. That's 81% more organic matter at the bottom of the vineyard. So this is going to start to tell the story of how these vines are performing differently because they are inherently in quite different situations from the top to the bottom of the vineyard. Going on, the cation exchange capacity at the top, 5.2 milliequivalents per 100 grams versus 8.15. That's 57% more cation exchange capacity. That means that the soils at the bottom had 57% more capability of holding on to available cations, the positively charged ions in the soil, than at the top. So when we look at those cations, potassium, phosphorus, magnesium, calcium, the differences are dramatic in three of the four cases. Potassium was about the same top to bottom, but look at the huge differences in phosphorus, magnesium, about a fourfold difference, and about a threefold difference in calcium. So we're dealing with quite a different soil chemistry from the top to the bottom of this vineyard. When we look at the pruning weights then, not across all vines in each of those treatments that we mentioned earlier, but if we look at the size of vines at the top of the slope, 
where we have less fertile, if you will, and less uh, organic matter in the soil, and less cation exchange capacity, the vines at the top of the slope average 2.8 pounds of pruning weight, and those at the bottom 6.4, you know, more than twice as large. And for those who aren't familiar with pruning weight data, we would generally expect that a large vine planted on an eight foot spacing would have a pruning weight of about three pounds when it's considered large. So the vines at the top of this slope were just perfectly matched to the space allotted for them, but the ones at the bottom are out of control with huge, huge vine size, twice what we'd really like to have. And the smaller but still large vines at the top actually produced more yield than those at the bottom across all the treatments. And we can explain this by the shading that those large canopies with large amounts of shoots and leaves are creating a lot of shading in those renewal areas on the top cordon and on the middle cordon so that we may prune them similarly, but the fruitfulness of the buds on those extremely large, excessively large vines at the bottom of the slope is having an impact on reducing overall productivity. Moving on, look at that. We had not only smaller clusters, but fewer of them. We had about 25 fewer, 25, 28, 33, it looks like, 33 fewer clusters per vine at the bottom of the slope than at the top. So the impact on shading is impacting fruitfulness as measured by clusters per vine. And the bricks were greater at the top of the vineyard, significantly so in this case, statistically significantly so, where we had the larger yield of 17.6 tons to the acre. We had a bricks of 15, and this is on the 13th of October. Keep in mind, this is a week before the commercial harvest, and 14.5 bricks for the 14 ton yield at the bottom. And we attribute this to not only the soil chemistry and the difference of the performance of vines in soil chemistry, but our ability to position the shoots on these vines effectively or not based on those large vine sizes. We can't take extremely large vines and expect that our mechanization is going to make up for that imbalance on the vine, that excessive vine size, only to a point, and then we're still going to have some shading that's going to take place. So we've got to do some things at the bottom of this vineyard in future years to get those vines back to a size that is more appropriate than we have presently. Now we're going to take a look at those four treatments again, and we're going to start by looking at just the treatments at the top of the slope and see what we can see there and then contrast them to those at the bottom. So here at the top of the slope with the lighter soils, lower organic matter, less cation exchange capacity, less capacity to hold water, water holding capacity, so that the vines don't develop as vigorously. Let's take a look at some of the numbers here now. Well, the pruning weights we had said earlier were averaging about four and a half pounds across all these four treatments. Well, that's because we averaged the pruning weights at the top of the vineyard and the bottom. But when we just look at the top of the vineyard, the pruning weights now are generally in the range of what we'd like about a three pound vine with the exception of the two tier cordon without the rootstock. We've gotten that treatment to the point where we're actually starting to lose vine size uh, below what we would like it to be. Nevertheless, these numbers are quite different 
than the four and a half pounds that averaged across all vines at the top and bottom of the vineyard. And the yields. We have a range of yields that are right in order with what we'd expect that the top wire cordon without a rootstock about 15 tons, 14.9. And at the bottom, the most vigorous treatment, two-tier cordon with SO4, 21.5 tons. And as we'd expect, the two-tier cordon training systems have significantly more clusters per vine because they have two cordons. They have two fruiting zones. And here we have the numbers that are all important. How did we mature this crop? And we got a range that is not statistically different, but there's a trend for the more vigorous treatments to have higher soluble solids, more than 15. So we are delighted and wish that we could have the whole vineyard performing like the two-tier cordon on SO4 rootstock at the top of the vineyard with 21 and a half tons and 15.2 bricks the week before commercial harvest. Now we add the bottom and I've got these rows color-coded so that the treatments of training system and rootstock are the same for the same color. So the light green is the top wire cordon with no rootstock. And you can look for yourself um, what the differences are from the top of the vineyard to the bottom of the vineyard. And they're, they are quite different. They are very different. We start with pruning weights. Look at the pruning weights at the bottom of the vineyard. Oh my gosh. We showed you the average of all of these, but all four of those treatments average six pounds of pruning weight or more in contrast to those at the upper part of the vineyard, which were only two to three pounds. So day and night difference. The yield, the yield towards the bottom, as we already said, is an average of all these treatments was less. And you can see the numbers for yourself. We had, for example, on the top wire cordon with no rootstock, we had 14.9 tons on the top. We had 10.6 on the bottom. And as we go down through, the overall treatment with the highest yield and the highest soluble solids, too, was that treatment at the top of the vineyard with two-tier cordon and SO4. Moving on, clusters, we've said this over and over, that when you have more cordons, you have more clusters, and there are the soluble solids. Very, very discouraging. In fact, if we look at the best treatment that we mentioned just uh, a little while ago, the two-tier cordon on SO4 rootstock with 21.5 tons, 15.2 bricks, contrast that with the same two-tier cordon on SO4 rootstock at the bottom of the vineyard has about three tons to the acre less and it's very statistically significant, more than one degrees bricks less, even though the yields were uh, also less. So here we have the same management of those vines at the top of the vineyard as the bottom but the outcome is entirely different. And the take home message is, we not only need to apply a certain regime or a certain architecture and a certain, man certain management skill to our vines, but we have to do that within the context of the overall vine size. And where we're out of control with excessively large vines at the bottom, many, many growers know this is not a good formula for success of yield and fruit maturity. Let's now look at some grape leaf petiole test results that we took as a part of this project. And we're going to look at those in regard to the four treatments that we have been mentioning over and over. Top wire cordon, two-tier cordon, with and without an SO4 rootstock. And we've already showed you the yields there and the range of yields. And we wondered if those yields would have uh, an impact on the nutrient levels in the vine. 
And what we found was, no, if you look up all across all of these macronutrients, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, they are statistically insignificantly different from one, from one to the other across all four of these macronutrients. Well, then we looked at the micronutrient concentrations in those leaf petioles. And micronutrients are those that are present in parts per million rather than whole percents. Uh, and generally, generally, there was very little to no difference among those four treatments for all of these micronutrients. If you're a statistician, you might see a little glitch in the zinc, but we think that's just an anomaly. By and large, we had levels of these micronutrients all pretty much the same across all four treatments when we averaged them at the top and the bottom of the vineyard. There were nutritional deficiency symptoms in Michigan Concord Vineyards in 2015. And we had some symptoms showing up in this model Concord Vineyard also. So sort of as a side trip, we're going to take a look at these and see what we can learn. This was a picture of one of the areas that showed some symptoms. And so we set out to take petiole tests in those problem areas and contrast them with petiole tests we took where there were no nutritional deficiency symptoms showing. Let's start out. This is actually something from a publication of Cornell University who really is renowned in grapevine nutrition. And this was published several years ago and I'm going to use it as a reference point. And we're going to start out and we're going to talk about three nutrients only. The first one is potassium. And potassium is considered deficient when the petiole test taken 60 to 70 days after bloom as the crop is ripening, when that potassium level in the petiole goes below 1%, that is regarded as a deficiency level. And when you have potassium deficiency, one of the symptoms that shows up is this scorching on the margins or on the edges of the leaves like this. Or you may have the condition known as black leaf. Uh, and that looks like this. So we thought we saw some of this in the areas that were having problems this year. So here is the table. The table is cons uh, consists of, in the first row, the data are where we did not see deficiency dis symptoms showing up. And then in the second row where it says, yes, that's where we had symptoms. And we're just going to look at it in that way. And we're going to start now with potassium. And keep in mind, less than 1% would be regarded as deficient. Well, here we are where there were no deficiency symptoms. We had an average across all the tests of 1.13, which is getting down close to that deficiency level. And sure enough, the range of those tests suggests that some of the tests were in the deficiency range, even though no symptoms were showing. So uh, there will be parts of the vineyard that will um, be deficient, and we will increase our efforts to treat this whole vineyard uh, with potassium fertilization uh, because we see that the levels of potassium are getting too low. Where we saw symptoms of deficiency, they averaged 0.47, which is way below that less than 1%. And look at this. Every one of those tests, I think there were six or eight of them that we took, and every single one of them was in a range that showed deficiency. So a lot of those symptoms we saw in the leaves could be traced back by petiole analysis to low levels 
of potassium. Moving on, we're going to look at another macronutrient, magnesium, and it would be considered, generally speaking, deficient when the level dips below 0.35 percent. So the deficiency of potassium, or excuse me, magnesium, looks like this. And a key factor in analyzing and, uh, and recognizing magnesium deficiency in a leaf is that you get that intervenal chlorosis and scorching, but at least on some of the leaves, some of the margins stay green. Can you see the left side of that leaf uh, where my forearm is located? You see that margin of the leaf that still has some greenness to it? That is a situation that only occurs as magnesium deficiency. So certainly uh, we're dealing with magnesium deficiency here. And keep in mind that when we have problems with nutritional problems, it's it's often not just one nutrient. It can be a complex of them. And the magnesium level on this particular sample was 0.38% right down uh, in that uh, headed for the less than 0.35. So we definitely had some magne magnesium deficiency showing in some of our samples. If we go to our table where we had no symptoms showing, it was at 0.5% on average, which suggests, the uh, as it should, that uh, on average there was no magnesium deficiency. But if we look at the range of the values that we took there, there had to be some of those tests that were actually experiencing magnesium deficiency. And here we can see 0.15 at the low end uh, puts up a flag about magnesium problems in the vineyard. If we look at where we saw symptoms, 0.42% is not right down to the 0.35% that we would say would be deficient. And the range is actually uh, makes us wonder, we're getting close to that deficiency level, and perhaps we've got some magnesium problems going on in these uh, some of these tests also. So we're right on the edge, right on the edge, whether we saw deficiency symptoms or not in this vineyard with regard to magnesium. The third nutrient we're going to talk about is one of the micronutrients, boron. And less than 30 parts per million is a guideline to suggest that if you take this sample 70 days after bloom or so, the latter part of the growing season, and you have less than 30 parts per million, that could well mean that you have a deficiency of boron. Well, we'll go back to our table, and we see that we're close on average to that 30 parts per million, and some of those areas that had no symptoms probably were deficient in boron, but we just didn't see it in the leaves. But look at this where we had symptoms showing 21 parts per million, and all of them well below that 30 parts per million. So this is, makes a strong case for some of the symptoms we saw, the leaf deficiency symptoms we saw, were likely due to low levels of boron in the test that we took. I take this quote from a textbook that is a great reservoir of information and the highlighted part says boron deficiency is easily confused with several other disorders the symptoms to look for are fruit set disorders and a leaf chlorosis which is very similar to that caused by a lack of magnesium however boron deficiency is concentrated on terminal leaves that's a key factor of the shoot whereas magnesium deficiency is concentrated on basil leaves. And I present this to growers today so that you can be aware of these issues, be looking for these situations in your vineyards next year during the growing season. Now, here's a picture that I took a lot of years ago to show a chlorosis of what we 
verified was boron deficiency. And you can see in general the chlorosis and the uh, necrotic areas would in general remind you of magnesium deficiency, but not really because we know that this is going to occur more terminally on a shoot, whereas magnesium deficiency with that occurrence of a green area on the margin of the leaf is going to be a key to tell us whether it's magnesium deficiency or something else. And the lack of fruit set, this is a really a key factor if you've got boron problems. This picture we took many years ago, but it doesn't have to be this dramatic to be a matter of boron deficiency. You can just have a relatively poor set with a few shot berries. So here is some cupping leaves. Here's where we had boron at 22 parts per million. The clusters you can't see, but they're kind of straggly. We've got these cup leaves, and this is much more reminiscent of a boron deficiency problem with those terminal leaves than magnesium. And here's another case that looks similar. By the way, the inner nodes tend to become shortened. We have 18 parts per million here at boron. And I, after the fact, noticed that this cluster with a somewhat poor set with a few shot berries may well be the result of a low boron level during the bloom period. Well, that's all for now. We thank you for your attention. We hope that this is informative to you and perhaps parts of it will help you in your grape growing. And we'll report further developments in this project as they occur. We can't wait to get on with 2016 and see what we can do to correct some of the problems in this model Concord vineyard. You can bet that we're going to do some things to the lower part of that vineyard uh, to get that large vine size back under control. And we'll report on that the next time around. Take care. Happy grape growing.